Hey there, are you ready? Because today is the day when you start figuring out how to create a home you love right now with what you already have and in the home you're currently living in. I'm Sandra, your host of the Style Matters podcast, brought to you by Little Yellow Couch. And I truly believe that you should not put off living inside something beautiful and energizing and nurturing for some imaginary perfect time in your life. You need those things now. And to help you get started, go download our free guide that'll help you clarify what your style actually is. Now, I'm not talking about identifying a style category like farmhouse or boho. I'm talking about nailing down something specific and wholly unique to who you are. And at the end of the guide, I'll give you next steps on how to start putting that style to work. To get it, just go to littleyellowcouch.com and click on the yellow button right at the top. So welcome to Little Yellow Couch and the Style Matters podcast. This community of listeners is your people. You found us and I am so glad you're here. Before we get started, I just want to tell you that next week we are on a podcast break. So you won't hear from me next Monday, but we'll be back the following Monday. All right. I just wanted to get that out there before I forget. Now, every once in a while, I have a maker on the show or a craftsperson or an artist. But the reason I don't have more of them is honestly... It can be difficult for them to put into words the meanings of their pieces or to articulate their creative process. These people work in visual mediums. They're not always used to talking about them. But today, you're going to hear from a sculptor who talks so eloquently about his craft and why we need to surround ourselves with beauty and I felt honored to talk with someone who thinks so deeply about his work. I'm really excited to share this episode with you. Ted Bradley is, um, well, I I would call him both an artist and a designer, as I, I think he would as well. He's created a new way of sculpting porcelain that contains light. Ultimately, these are meant to be pendant lights, really amazing, show-stopping pendant lights. But, but really, I think they can serve as a central element of a room's story, transforming that space into something unexpected, delightful, illuminating, if you'll excuse the pun, but it's true. This one is really juicy, guys. Here's Ted. Ted Bradley, welcome to the Style Matters podcast. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here and talk with you. Wonderful. I I am really interested in how things are made. And I think it's so important for those of us that end up purchasing things, furniture, objects, art, whatever, that we're going to bring into our homes, that they really deserve the space they take up in our homes. And I think one way to know whether or not they deserve the space, obviously, we have to love them. But understanding how something's made and what goes into it, the the thought process, the materials, the time. So we're going to dig into all of that with this endeavor that you are on. But first, I really want to hear your personal story about how you even started this. I don't, maybe it was seven years ago or something, but you were in the tech world. You know, you have a mechanical engineering background or something. How did you get to become this sculpture, sculptor, a sculptor of lighting, no less? Yeah, uh, I, you know, one of the very first things that I ever found that I was passionate about was ceramics. And it was my freshman year in high school. I had to choose, hmm. choose an, elect, an elective. Yeah. I've never done ceramics or even know I would enjoy it, but uh, I had to fill, fill the class. So right. um, I jumped in and then I just fell head over heels in love with it. There was, wow. there was something, um, something about the opportunity to express complex feelings as like a young man, as a kid. Uh, through a tangible medium while working with my hands in this very like creative and meditative process. I just fell head over heels in love with it. And wow. I, I didn't stop for years. I did ended up doing eight semesters of ceramics in high school and then continued <gasps> on to do engineering and uh, ceramics at the same time in, in college as well. Wow. I love how you've described <laughs> that. I, I'm the mom of two boys. One's 20 and one's 18. And yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think that that is so valuable that that just exactly the way you put it. All right. So so you you are dual majoring or something in, yep. in ceramics and mechanical engineering, and then somehow you end up in the tech world. Well, exactly. And that's kind of the funny thing is like, um, you know, I think we we view life as, you know, time is infinite and you can you can pivot and move and change and pursue all these different things. And I think that there's a lot of pressure um, as a young person exiting college to do, or even before, to do the things that you think you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, you know, landing in tech and you know trying to build this um, this more traditional career yeah. is what I feel like um, you know very uh, well-intending people you know helped steer me toward it, and it was. Yeah there's a lot of opportunity in tech. Um, it was a great career. I worked with, you know, a lot of wonderful, smart people and got to work on products with billions of people, which is such an incredible opportunity. Um, but in the end, you know, I, I, like, I, uh, there came a point where I'm like, wait a second. Um, you know, to your question, how did I get here? Um, is this for sure what I want to be doing with my life? Um, and I think it wasn't a snap decision, but I think that, uh, the answer in really looking at it was no, this isn't it. And, mm. and wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't it be incredible if I could do these things that I'm just so passionate about and have been forever and do them as a career and, and do them as my life's work? Mm. Um, Love those questions. And, and yes, I mean, it, it's, it sometimes takes some bravery to leave behind what we've, you know, where we kind of staked our claim and we've, we've invested our time and ourselves and our energy and in a career path, but um, looking just checking in with yourself every year or so, am I still happy? Is this still doing it for me? So, so what was it about lighting in particular? Uh, So you knew what you, 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 your passion was ceramics. You, you probably knew you were going to do something with that, but how did, how did you come to marry lighting and, and ceramics? Yeah, or or yeah. lighting and sculpture, let's say. So funny enough, when I joined, when I joined that elective ceramics class freshman, freshman year, right away, the very first thing I started creating was, um, I, I haven't even talked about this or thought about this in, in 20 years. <laughs> okay. Um, but I created this, uh, this, this little um, vessel for a candle and it was like a dream catcher. And I think it was super really? meaningful to yeah. me at the time. And then all these years later, um, when I was working at Google and, and in tech, um, I had this very specific vision and uh, it was always the same huh. uh, or different versions of it. Um, and I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd have this, this exact same sculpture in my head. <laughs> wow. um, and I even started building it at one point. And then just like put all the pieces away because it was just too complicated. Uh-huh. Um, but this piece has all of these uh, these white porcelain rings lined up in a row in exact parallel. Um, and they're all affixed to a metal spine. And it's sort of like the, you know, these, these arching ribs of a, of a whale skeleton bleached in the sun. And that's the aesthetic it has. For me, I don't know if the inspiration really was is the whale. It's an easy way to describe it. Right. There's something much more meaningful to it uh, that I think I, it will still kind of like, maybe I'll never fully understand, but <laughs> essentially there, it has themes in it that, uh, that, that I've been playing with my whole life, which is the themes of geometric perfection and precision and the masculine and the durable and this, the, the, the elements of this metal mm. and then merged with this much softer, more organic, mm. uh, handmade, uh, you know, porcelain component. Yeah. And then the porcelain, even, you know, it starts as wet mud. It's, um, it's this incredibly, uh, you know, malleable, organic, delicate material, but then trying to get that wet mud to become a perfect circle is it is its own area to explore. Um, yes. Well, and I, we, I really want to talk about that because I know that was a process to yeah, put, it, to put yeah. it mildly, but, but so, so you right. have these porcelain rings in your mind, these beautiful white, perfect porcelain rings. How, when did you envision this? Because I could see this 
this, you, you know, your, your, your first, your first um, product, which, which, which is this, this kind of, like you said, it, it looks, it does, it really reminds you of a whale skeleton, yeah. the ribs of the whale. Yeah. Um, when did it occur to you to make it a, a, a light? Though? Right. So in this sculpture, there's, there is death. When you see it, you might see a skeleton. Right. And I think that was a feeling that was coming out of me in creating this sculpture. But in this sculpture as well, there's life. <laughs> and the life is the light. Yes. And it's coming from inside. And there's this whole tension between the metal and the precision and the ceramic and the organic and the death and the life oh. and the struggle and all of these things. I actually just got a little bit of chills. Yeah, me too. Talking about, <laughs> talking about this day, it's still so it's still so exciting. I don't understand what is what it is in this sculpture, but um, there is life in this sculpture, and the light is every bit as important as, as the form in the materials. Oh, wow, interesting. And and I just want to comment for for people who uh, we're going to have photos on on our website for sure, and and we'll link to your website as well. But but for those who are listening right now and they're not seeing what we're seeing. Um, as far as I can tell, you can't see the actual lights. They are they are embedded in the porcelain. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's a porce, it's a it's a it's a porcelain uh, ring or a hoop. Yeah. And on the inside surface, there are every ring has over a thousand LEDs that have been embedded on the inside surface yeah. and then covered with a light diffusing lens. And it, so it really is emanating light. Yeah. I love yeah. that we can't see the bulbs. It, we can't see where it's coming from. It's just yeah. within the porcelain. That to me is really phenomenal. I don't know if that was the hard part or actually tell us about the hard part. Let's talk about this process. It was all the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, after many years of dreaming, I, I finally, uh, you know, decided to take the plunge and I, I knew I couldn't do it part-time. I tried to do it part-time and it just wasn't possible. So, okay. um, I quit my job and, and decided to, to go all in and, um, you know, being, uh, you know, in people like to say, Oh, there's, it's so courageous. Yeah. I think encourage, encourage there is, um, there is, you know, both the audacity and there's maybe a little bit of naivety. And I, I, sure. I, I will, I will claim, uh, I will, uh, you know, um, I will claim both if, if that's okay. Um, and the, 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 the naivety part was, I thought that it would take two months to make these rings. Um, <laughs> okay. and my goal I'm laughing because I know the story. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was November. I, I said, okay, by, uh, it's no, it's, uh, it's end of October by, you know, by the end of the year, I will have finished my prototype. And by the next, you know, March, I will be already, you know, off to the races with wow. these, um, and the, one of the first things I did was I, I called up a, um, you know, a couple of master mold makers and a clay, a clay chemist, uh, one of the fo foremost clay chemists um, in ceramics. And they, they all had the same, they all, they all said the same thing. They said, Hey, just so you, you know, just so you know, if you, this may be impossible, um, <sighs> but if you are able to do it, um, it's going to be a nine out of 10 difficulty. And you're asking a lot of questions about how to form the clay um, how to turn this wet mud into this perfect circle. But if you succeed at doing this equally difficult, we'll be drying this ring without it cracking or huh. deforming and then firing equally difficult to that. We'll be firing it in a kiln to over 2000 degrees without it cracking or deforming. And it ended up taking about 10 well, it took over 12 months altogether. And I had, you know, I had hundreds of failures. I worked by hand through over 1400 pounds of clay and oh. all of my days and nights disappeared and into the weekends and hundred hour work weeks. And it became a little, a little bit of, a, of an obsession. Wow. Um, yeah. But it, it was true. Uh, once I finally, you know, learned how to form this clay into a perfect circle, drying was every bit as difficult and firing was every bit as difficult. and it was, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was very involved. <laughs> so, so how did you not give up? Yeah. So I think that the reason that I, I wanted, I was so motivated to go into this space is because, um, I think that we are 
all, this is actually, this is a, a thought um, that's, that was inspired by a good friend of mine, a, a family friend and a mentor. Um, I think we all have different areas in our life that we might have skills that could allow us to do a job with proficiency. Maybe you have great social skills or organizational skills or engineering skills, whatever it may be. And these may allow you to have a, a successful job or a successful career. Um, and those are, those are skills that, you know, everybody has, but maybe each person has also like what, what this mentor would call like a gift. And it's something mm-hmm. that is, is unique just to them and something that they can use, um, to bring something hopefully, you know, different and special to the world. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I didn't know what mine was. I don't think I'm the best ceramicist and I'm certainly not the best engineer and I'm, you know, not the best business person or anything, but after a year of thinking about this, I I think that I realized maybe the combination of all these things together Mm. is something that is actually kind of a unique combination. And maybe, maybe that's my one special thing is not being the best at any one thing, but kind of having some skill set in, in, in a couple of things and bringing them together. And so to answer your question, you know, how did I, what is, how did I, how do I, how did I persevere? And with this tenacity, I think that because these, this was such a meaningful process and such a meaningful sculpture, and these were areas, ceramics and engineering is a combination and an area of tremendous passion for me, rather than getting burned down by the process. I was enlivened by the process. Wow. And I think, I think that's behind all of this. That's the goal is to be doing something that, that, that is enlivening and enriching Mm -hmm. um, to, to my life experience and, and in the process, hopefully bring beautiful things to the world. Wow. Process is yes. Um, if we don't love the process, we're probably in the wrong line of work. Yeah. Um, and I, I, but, but I think it, it holds true, not just for that narrow band of work, but, but just life in general, um, always be trying to always try to look for ways in which the process is in and of itself rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in order to be happy. Um, Wow. Okay. So, so can I share one last thing? Please. I just feel like it's bubbling out of me. Yes, please. There's, you know, like a saying, like, um, what is it like? If you love what you do, you'll, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Yeah. I, it took me a long time. And I think that so many people, uh, we're all seeking to be novel and unique <laughs> and to, to somehow find the truths of life. I think the truths of life are embroidered on your grandmother's pillow, like a little. <laughs> It's like a home is where the heart is. A home is where the heart is. Like, right. You know, Do we I mean, need like, a pillow to say that? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but like just that expression, you know, yeah. if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It's true. It's right. true. And right. we can just pass it by, but, or we could shift our entire, we could build an entire life around that statement. <laughs> yeah. And maybe that's, that's the path. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know. Sometimes cliches, well, they're, they're cliches because they're so true, but then we stop listening to them. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're we ignore them. So, okay. So you, you've got, you finally perfected a single ring that somehow yeah. is a perfect circle and it is not cracked in the, in the kiln process. Yeah. Is this before you even tried to put light in it or, or is it, did you always have to try to keep incorporating the light as well in order to find the, yeah. part where it worked. Okay. I, I was working on small sections of ring broken ring and, and, um, you know, distorted ring in parallel, um, and doing testing on that with things like temperature and light output and, um, and like electrical characteristics to make sure that it was, it was, um, you know, going to be, uh, you know, beautiful and safe and all those things. So when I finally finished my first set of rings for this sculpture about, you know, 11, 11 and a half months in, um, by that time, I did have uh, kind of a process set up for embedding the LEDs, so that that okay. was helpful. Okay. And, and yeah. part of, part of the challenge, I would just say, like part of the challenge is this, like is uh, the iterative process of learning. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you are working in software and you make a change in the code, mm-hmm. you can would be like, uh, you know, um, compile and run it and test your code with a few keystrokes. Yes. And know instantly whether or not the changes you just made were successful and had the output that you desired. But with ceramics, that input that you change up front 
you won't learn the effect of that for three to four weeks. Wow. And so, so you, then do you wait for three to four yeah. weeks or do you just keep trying other things and you, you mark like what, what you changed each time you keep going. But then okay. what happens is you'll pour 80 hours into something wow. and you have made four changes wow. and three of them were, and then at the end, all of the rings, you open up the kiln after a 2000 degree firing and every ring from top to bottom is broken oh, and God. you don't know why because you changed four things. Right. And so you can only change a handful of things at a time, but you have to then, you know, sort of um, try to theorize uh, which of these things cause the issue and then back up from there, keep the other three and then change the one. Sure. That's why the process is so, so oh, slow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so I don't know how, uh, I don't know how, granular we want to get into the, the yeah. technicalities of the process but I do have one other question about it which is I think of porcelain and some of it is incredibly thin mm. um, some of the dishware that you've seen you know mm-hmm. that we've seen from China um, it, it can be very delicate so mm-hmm. and it's been made for thousands well hundreds of years so how, how is this different why is this yeah. so difficult yeah. So a, a couple of things, a, those, those plates and, and everything that you're using, they are all from China and these are technologies that have been developed for thousands of years. And I, I also just learned that even, uh, you know, um, even, uh, there's a porcelain facility that's been open for like 400 years and they still have a yield rate of about 80%. So they're still throwing away 20% of everything wow. they have after working to perfect the process for, you know, hundreds of years. Wow. A, I'll say that B, the second thing is that every vase, um, every production vase, mug, bowl, plate, cup you've ever held in your hand uses a, a, a ceramic production process called slip casting, okay. where you're pouring a liquid clay mm-hmm. into a mold. Okay. Um, but you can't make rings with slip casting, which is why those master mold makers said right up uh, at the beginning, this is going to be incredibly difficult. And there's two reasons why you can't do it. One is um, if you were to imagine a couple a, a mold to make the rings, you might have two mold halves, a lower and an upper. Okay. And then you would pull these apart. And if it's like a bowl or a vase or whatever, that would be very easy to do. But if it's a with the ring where the LEDs are embedded, there's this deep channel inside. And in mold making, that's called an undercut. Okay. And an undercut would prevent these two plaster mold halves from releasing. That, oh. Oh. that's the first part. And then the huh. second part is with a vase, for example, you pour in the liquid clay and then porcelain as it dries will shrink up to 20, 18 to 21% over the process through firing. And so okay. if it's a vase, you use that to your advantage, it'll shrink away from the mold and then you just pop it out. Oh, right. Okay. But with a ring, the outside surface is molded. And then there's also an inside, a complex inside surface. And so imagine if this ceramic, this clay was going to draw or as it was going to dry and shrink, it doesn't, unlike a vase, it doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't shrink into anything. So it would crash. So you just run away, you have to throw away the number one process that that is used in ceramic production. (laughs) Right, right. So you really had to come up with a new process as well. I did. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, well, fascinating. But now let's talk about the beauty of it all. Sculpturally, I mean, they really are sculptures. And I think that's what really drew me to them. I think lighting in general is just such a, it's such a wonderful addition to a space when it's, you know, when you have the ability to think thoughtfully about what you want and how you want to illuminate the space. And yours really are works of art. And I was wondering, first of all, let's, let, let's describe them. We've already described the one that, that the first one you did, which was this, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like a, the ribs of a whale. The, the others are very, quite different. They're all, they all have rings, mm. but the ones that are hanging, I guess, from cables, you'll tell us what they're mm. hanging from. To me, there's so much movement to them. It's on the one hand, I can picture like a juggler with rings, throwing them into the air and they just sort of land in a, in a webbing. Mm, of of cables yeah. and and yeah. so so there's this there's this well vitality this aliveness you mentioned that before as well 
yeah. to those. And then you have another another set of lights where it's it's much more rigid and it's affixed to metal. Yeah. What is your thought process behind the artistic side of it? Yeah, it, it's a super fun question. And there's a lot of different ways to answer it. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll just try in brief to describe a couple. I think one is art versus design. So the first sculpture I ever built, I would definitely call that art. You know, it's literally the manifestation of a feeling, something okay. that, is, that is coming out. Design, it, in my mind, is... Um, where you're given a set of criteria um, and then you need to create within these tight boundaries to satisfy a purpose. Yes. And so I think that my subsequent sculptures are a combination of both. One thing I learned right away when I was, I walked around uh, a bunch of different showrooms and studios in San Francisco with these sketches. And I said, what do you think about these? And I, I thought that as a, you know, doing user research, like in software, I would end up with, <laughs> Um, you know, I would hone in on like the one perfect product. <laughs> yes. It wasn't, didn't work that way at all. And that's <laughs> right, like right. everyone liked something different. Um, Interesting. And so, um, I think that, you know, in wanting to, wanting to build out this collection, um, I, I, I say I'm painting space with rings mm. and I need to create something more orderly. I need to create something uh, for, for one aesthetic. For another aesthetic, I need to create something more chaotic and natural. Mm. For mm. another aesthetic, I need to create something that will complement a geometric space. Or or for another space, I need to break up that geometric space. For example, with a sculpture you're talking about with these, you know, these hanging graceful arcs that will just like in a in a room full of rectangles and boxes, yeah. it will just it will just uh it'll capture your attention and and break up all, all that rigidity. Um, yes. So I think there's the design in that. Um, and then the art is the capturing of the feeling. So if I'm driving somewhere um, or I'm on a plane for whatever reason on the plane, I'm always imagining things. Um, <laughs> well, it's like, it's like, free it's time like your shower. I, it's like your shower time. It's like the shower, yeah. <laughs> you have to fly. <laughs> yeah. I think there's design pieces. There's artistic pieces. This is a great time to talk about, talk about nature. I just feel like um, I'm personally inspired by nature. And I would go so far, you know, my own personal aesthetic and belief system is that if you really take the time to slow down and look deeply and intricately at a single flower, that flower, the textures, the colors, the complexity, the precision is <laughs> more beautiful than any sculpture mm. that anyone in the history of the world has ever, <laughs> ever made myself included. And I, I, I don't believe myself to ever, you know, surmount that it's more, why don't I allow myself to be both humber, humbled and inspired yes. by this and take elements like the constellations in the night sky or, um, you know, the vi vi weeping vines mm. in a, um, you know, a more tropical area or um the the bowing branches of an aspen tree weighted down with snow mm. um and just give it give a nod to the these uh these themes um and and bring the, bring them into my work and and i'll also just say i think that people i think that people are most comfortable around beautiful themes uh beautiful themes inspired by nature as well. And mm -hmm. I think if we bring those into the home, it actually brings an aliveness uh, to a home that might, might otherwise um, lack that, that natural vitality. Uh, yes, I completely agree. I think that's why there's this plant craze that's been going on mm, that that yeah. is not dying i mean people are still into it you know i mean we went like the 70s was like everybody had plants and then in the 80s and 90s we didn't want any of it you know it was all about man-made stuff yeah and now we're getting we're getting back to it and and thankfully this this trend is lasting but your your rings your sculptural pieces that i can very much see what you're talking about. I think that's what I meant by, especially the ones that are hanging from the, the cables that they, there's this movement to them. Mm -hmm. There's this mm -hmm. beautiful, um, um, you know, you can almost see them swinging in the breeze or, or like I said, I can see how they were sort of thrown up in the air and then they're sort of caught in vines, as you say, which, which is, they're just, they really do 
make a difference in a room. And so let's let's talk about my last question. Why does style matter? What 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 do you hope these do for a room? What feelings do you hope to evoke? Why does any of this matter? Yeah, I, I love that question. And I think it's one, um, you know, on the one hand, I spend so much time in the nitty gritty and the engineering and uh, the problem solving, but um, <laughs> this is the most important question, right? This is, <laughs> this is the high level question of, um, of why, why all this matters to somebody. I think there's two elements. I think that first off, I want to complement the space. So the sculpture needs to fit in the space mm. and feel like it is complementary and associated and at home. Mm. Okay. Um, but then secondly, I want to enliven the space. It's an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, and I feel very, you know, very privileged to have in some ways chosen this, but in some ways fallen into this. Like what a unique opportunity to be the one to get to create something that often becomes the piece that defines or creates a focal point or yes. enlivens. It's a, it's a privilege and an opportunity and a challenge. Yes. And, um, you know, just like we were talking about with breaking up straight lines, verticals and horizontals, um, or um, you know, introducing natural elements, or creating a band of light that feels like it's emanating from a ring. I think that we can create a moment of beauty, a moment perhaps of tranquility, mm. a moment of the unexpected. I want to create a moment of a story. This is more than a, an aesthetic. You know, if mm. if someone's showing this this that dining room, you know, sculpture to somebody, they say, and they say, oh, so beautiful. And then I want to create a moment where, where they can share, yes, and I want to tell you the story of how it was made, because I feel like that's every bit as important. And in the end, all of this, all of this is about creating a home of meaning. And my, my goal is to, is to facilitate that. Mm. What you said about story and how important the story is, when I think about art, just art, not, not, not design, but art, I think of, I always think there are two layers of story that are equally important. One is the story in the artist's mind. It's like you described it earlier. It's, it's trying to manifest a feeling into mm -hmm. the visual world. And, and that's the backstory, right? And that, that's fascinating. And we've learned so much about your backstory today. And then there's the story of the person who is viewing and experiencing and stepping into that art. And it's what they, how they interpret it, what mm -hmm. it means to them. Yeah. And I think that that is, if I owned one of your pieces, that, that would be so fascinating to think about, okay, why am I choosing this particular mm. sculptural piece? Why am I choosing this particular lighting fixture? I will have my own meaning for it. I'll have my own reasons for it. I'll have my own things I want it to do for me yeah. in terms of how I feel. And so yeah. I think it's that combination that really makes what you're doing works of art, mm. even I though I understand that. there's a function to it. Yeah. And I understand that they're heavily designed, but they're, <laughs> it's that, it's that, um, the fact that I can, there's room for me to interpret and put my own layer of meaning on what you've done that makes it feel like art to me. I love that. Um, I love that. And I, I couldn't agree more. And, and like you said, each person is going to not only have a different way of interpreting it, but they're going to be looking for different things in choosing a light, light sculpture or a light fixture. And um, the person who chooses mine might be someone who's especially drawn to, to the story and the inspiration and the handmade process and um, sort of the, the un, maybe even the unknown and upstart element <laughs> right, of being right. brand new. You know, I'm not, <laughs> exactly. I'm not the Mercedes Benz on the block, you know, like that's definitely <laughs> not me. Um, and some people want that and that's great, but um, yeah, I think yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's people connecting with the aesthetic and the feeling and the person who's making them. Well, speaking of how you are growing your business and you are, you know, you're the new kid on the block, but you're also really starting to establish your, yourself so much. And um, so tell us 
where can people find these pieces? They are, what showrooms are they in, or at least what cities or is online, whatever? Yeah, definitely. So um, I do have a growing number of showrooms around um, the country, which is wonderful. And yeah. then, um, of course, on my website, you can see some photos of my work um, in, in the context of, of the places, the homes they've been installed. And then lastly, um, if you'd like to see the full collection, I have maybe 50 different works. Uh, we have a little uh, a little uh, button you press and you enter your, your email address and then we'll send uh, send the full collection for you to take a look and, and can help choose a piece that's that's just perfect uh, perfect for your space. Oh, wow. That's that's fantastic. And like I said, we'll link to all of that in the show notes page for this episode and also share some, some photos. I love the photos. Well, I love the process photos because they're so cool and interesting, but I love seeing them in spaces to see how they're being used. Uh, Ted, this has been such a great talk. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege and an opportunity. Uh, I appreciate it. It's always, it, it's very fun to talk about as well. So thank you. Okay. I hope that was helpful and inspiring. Do check out our website, littleyellowcouch.com, where you can see photos and links from this episode, learn about my slow style approach to design, and grab your free style guide to get you started on your signature style today. Have a great week. Bye for now.